Welcome back. This session, I'd like to take a look at the re most recent high-profile IPO to hit the market, which is Lyft. Last Friday, Lyft filed its prospectus, and as the first of the ride-sharing companies to go public, it's of special interest, and here's why. If the Lyft IPO goes well, I can almost guarantee you that there are other ride-sharing companies waiting to come into the markets, and the pricing and the timing of those offerings will very much be determined by how Lyft is received by markets. So given that Lyft is a high-profile ride-sharing company, let's try to value it. Let's start by looking at the background. Ride-sharing has exploded as a business. The most impressive statistic to me when I look at ride-sharing is not just the dollar revenues, the growth you've had in your revenues, but how quickly ride-sharing has penetrated, not just into the younger, more tech-savvy crowd, but into the rest of the market. I tell people that I knew ride-sharing had arrived when my mother, who is... Um, who is a conservative South Indian woman said she was using Uber on her on her smartphone. I said, well, Uber's arrived. And while the growth initially was in the United States, because that's where ride sharing was born, it's exploded in Asia especially, with many Asian countries having their own uh, homegrown ride sharing companies. India is Ola, China is DD, Malaysia is Grab Taxi. So essentially you've seen ride sharing take off. Europe has been a bit of a holdout, but even in Europe, you're starting to see ride-sharing find its way in. Now, the regulatory push in Europe has pushed back, but even their growth has taken off. Now, if you look at why ride-sharing has so quickly almost decimated the taxi business, some of it is self-inflicted on the part of the taxi business. Some of it is just determined by how the rules were written, and some of it might be a little scary in terms of what the ride-sharing companies are exploiting. Here are four things that I think have allowed ride-sharing companies to grow as fast as they have. The first is the status quo as it existed in terms of car service before the ride-sharing com companies came along, for lack of a better word, stuck. Taxi, if you look at the taxi business, it hadn't changed in decades until 2009. Why did they need to? They, they had a captive audience. They could do what they'd always done. They refused to keep up with technology or reflect consumer taste. Second, because of the way taxi cab, the taxi cab business was regulated, rules had been written, and these rules went back decades. Nobody even knew why the rules were there. And some of them were actually lobbied for by some special interests that wanted to make money off the rules. So the taxi cab business was stymied with rules. And guess what? When the ride-sharing companies came along and they did not have to follow those same rules, it gave them a decisive advantage. It is true that the sharing business in general, whether it be Airbnb or ride-sharing, is exploiting an underutilized resource, and particularly true for ride-sharing, and here's why. I mean, if you own a car, think of how much time during the day you actually use your car. For most people, the cars they own sit idle 20 to 20, the car, I mean, my car sits idle probably 167 out of 168 hours every week because I don't drive it off. So what ride-sharing companies were exploiting was excess capacity, excess capacity that the owners of cars could then monetize by driving the cars for ride-sharing. That's the good side of ride-sharing. The bad side is I think that the drivers for ride-sharing companies have systematically underestimated their costs, their long-term costs, insurance costs, maintenance costs, repair costs. I know there's that famous MIT study that showed that drivers for Uber and Lyft make 3 to $4 an hour. I think it's a little, that's a little overdone and they kind of, you know, I, I think the data had a problem in it. But I do think that I don't buy into the pitch by ride-sharing companies that this is somehow a way in which you can make an income. Uh, uh, enough of an income to survive as an individual because most drivers for ride sharing companies don't make enough money. And you can blame, they can, you can say that it's their fault for driving, but that might be true, but that's one of the building blocks for why ride sharing has succeeded. Now here's the bad news. In spite of its success in, in terms of growth and expanding into the market, uh, marketplace and acquiring market share, there's bad news in ride sharing. The bad news is while revenues have grown, none of these companies seem capable of making money. Just to give you a sense of how much money ride-sharing companies have lost, in 2018, Lyft reported that its loss was $911 million. And that probably understates the loss because some of their other expenses are stock compensation expenses that haven't shown up in those losses. Uber lost $1.8 billion. DD lost $1.6 billion. And the only reason Ola and Grab lose less money is because they're much smaller. They all are money-losing machines.
Now, some of this you can attribute to where these companies are in the life cycle. The young companies, say that's what you should expect. That's true. There are economies of scale, and as these companies grow, maybe the losses will go away. But these losses, that at least the ride-sharing companies, don't seem to show much benefits from economies of scale. They're not dropping as fast as you'd expect them to. And that leads me to suspect that there's a, there's a fundamental business structure that's getting in the way of profitability. And here's what I think it is. Ride-sharing was built on two building blocks. What allowed them to grow so fast was low capital intensity. They did not own the cars. And independent contractors as, as drivers, basically, that didn't employ the drivers. So that allowed Uber to get to 600 cities over a 10-year period. So it allows ride-sharing companies to grow really quickly. That's the good news. The bad news is those two forces, the low capital intensity and free agent drivers, is also, in my view, what makes this business so difficult to make profitable. So as we look forward, I think that there's a fundamental problem that ride-sharing companies have to deal with, which is they have to restructure their businesses. So let's look at what the playing field looks like today. If you look at the playing field today, it, I, in, in 2015 when I looked at ride-sharing and I pointed out the flaw in the business model, I pointed to a few pathways that the, that the ride-sharing companies could adopt to start to make money. And tongue-in-cheek, maybe half tongue-in-cheek, one of the models I suggested was the Mafia Commission. I know you're shocked, but, but, but listen to me. In the 1920s, uh, the Mafia in New York City found it had a problem. The Mafia families were in open warfare, destroying each other. So in 1931, the Mafia families, the five family heads, called a meeting. It's called the Mafia Commission, and they said, this can't continue. We're just going to destroy each other. So what came out of it was they divided the city among the five families and the peace held for almost five decades, where essentially each family was given its own fiefdom and as long as they stayed in their own fiefdom, nobody bothered them. In fact, The Godfather is that famous scene where the five families try to reenact the Mafia Commission. You see, what's this got to do with ride sharing? If you look at what's happened since 2015, when you had open competition in every part of the world, here's what seems to have happened. Uber left China, right, and in return it got 20% of DD. It's left Southeast Asia and sold off its share to Grab. It's left Russia and sold off its share to Yandex Taxi. So now China has all DDs to conquer, Southeast Asia has all Grab, and Uber has left them to their own devices. In fact, it might only be a matter of time before Uber decides to leave India and leave it to Ola. In fact, you could actually argue that the United States may be the most competitive ride-sharing market in the world because it has two competitive players, an Uber and Lyft. Because Lyft does seem to have survived here. And here it's interesting to look at the contrast between the two companies. Again, in 2015, in, the, in a series of posts on ride-sharing, I compared the two companies. And I talked about them in terms of the stories they were telling. I called Uber the ultimate big story company. They were going to be all things to all people. They were going to be in delivery and moving and car service in all parts of the world. That's a big story. Lyft, in contrast, and it had very clearly drawn a line, said, we're going to stay in car service. We're going to stay in the U.S. A small story company, a focus story. Now, if you think about which story you like, there are pluses and minuses to each story. But in 2015, I argued that as an investor, I'd much rather invest in Lyft rather than Uber. And here's why. With its big story, I thought Uber was setting itself up for distraction and disappointment. Distraction because they had to do all the stuff that they promised the world they would do. And disappointment because ex expectations were sky high. In a way, what's happened since 2015 is confirm what I thought would happen. Uber has had a series of distractions, right? Management changes, uh, scandals, you know, divestitures. Lyft had stayed, has stayed true to its focus. It stayed in the U.S., stayed in car service. And in, in the last three years, Lyft has been able to increase its market share at the expense of Uber. I'm not saying Lyft has won the game, but it's been able to survive and actually make this a real contest. Both companies now are in the bike and have joined the bike and the scooter case, uh, craze with Uber buying Jump and Lime and Lyft buying Motivate. So clearly this fight is just beginning. I don't see either company walking away from this fight. And that might be bad news for investors in both companies because that competition will play out as margin staying in check.
So the value lift, I'm going to tell you the story that I will that will drive my valuation. As you know from my previous valuations of young companies, I firmly believe that with young companies, the narrative drives the numbers, the story drives the numbers, rather than the other way around. So rather than focus on the historical date and the prospectus, because there's not much here, here's what my story for lift looks like. It, in fact, I am building off the management story because in this case, I, the management story actually reflects what they've actually been doing. It, it's a credible story. So I'm going to see in my story, here's what I assume will happen. Lyft will stay a U.S. transportation services company. So it's going to stay with its U.S. focus, you know, U.S. slash Canada, in transportation services. I know that in the prospectus, Lyft talks about being in the transportation business, but that's a little bit of PR. The reason they like to use the entire transportation business, it's about $1.2 trillion. But that includes what people pay for cars. I don't think what they will pay for car service is going to be as, you know, anywhere near that. So I'm assuming $120 billion transportation services market for the U.S. That is about twice what I estimated 10 years ago. So that tells you a little bit about how ride-sharing has kind of changed my perspective on the size of this market. I'm going to assume that ride sharing is going to continue to do what it's done for the last 10 years, which is to draw new users from mass transit, people who drive their own cars, and that the transportation services market is going to double over the next 10 years. 10 years ago when I told my, or seven years ago when I told my story for Uber, uh, for my Uber valuation, my original story, I assumed that ride sharing companies would have local networking benefits, that they would get to dominate a city, but that city dominance wouldn't travel to other cities. I've changed my mind because looking at how much this business is consolidated, I think there are market networking benefits, and I think there are going to be two, maybe three winners in the U.S. market, and Lyft is going to be one of them. So I'm going to give them a 40% market share of this transportation services business. I'm also going to assume that the percentage of the gross billings, because remember, the way ride-sharing works is when you use a ride-sharing service, when you pay the driver of $10 or $20 or $50, the ride-sharing company gets 20% of that fare if it's a conventional Lyft or Uber. It's different with pooling, but that's what it is. Now that 20% is a completely arbitrary number that somebody said at the start of this business, but nobody in this business wants to mess with it because it's too, I mean, it's what keeps them sustained. Lyft in 2018 actually reported a 26.77% market share. I don't know how the number got that high, but there are a few qualifiers in their gross billings. They don't count some stuff that you pay as a fare. And there's probably a rise of pooling. I don't think that 26.77% is sustainable, and I think that number will revert back towards the 20%. I do think that um, that the that drivers as independent contractors, a facade that all the ride-sharing companies have maintained since their inception, is going to be with us for much longer. It's one thing when every few thousand people working as Uber and Lyft drivers to maintain this, but when you have millions of people driving for ride-sharing companies, Uber is estimated to have three million drivers around the world. Governments start to think about, hey, where are these people going to get their unemployment, their pensions? So increasingly, even in the U.S., you're starting to see states push back, and New York State recently announced that Uber drivers and Lyft drivers will be treated as employees. You're saying, so what? It is going to increase the cost structure for the ride-sharing companies, and it will expose them to more legal liability because now you can no longer hide behind the shelter that they're just independent contractors, and if they do something stupid, it's really not our fault. So those things will all play out, and they're part of my story. To tie up the last loose ends here, the rest of the pieces that I need to finish my valuation. I need a cost of capital for Lyft, and given that it's a young company where the inputs are still fuzzy, here's what I did. I used a shortcut. I went to the 75th percentile of cost of capital for all U.S. companies. I have 7,200 U.S. companies in my sample. And and that 75th percentile gives me a cost of capital of 9.97% to start the game. You, you might say, what do you mean start the game? Over the next 10 years, I assume that Lyft will get much bigger and more profitable. And as that happens, I'm going to lower the cost of capital down towards a median for all U.S. companies, which is 8.24%. Lyft will have to reinvest money. And I think they will have to start reinvesting more like a technology company especially as you start to see a shift towards autonomous vehicles. So for every $2.50 in additional revenue, I'm going to, ask, I'm going to require Lyft to invest a dollar. And I think that's probably a realistic assumption. 
I'm also going to assume that given that they're still losing money with no, no, clear, no clear pathway to profitability, that there is a, a chance, and not an insignificant chance that they might not make it. And I'm going to give a 10% chance they won't make it. And finally, for the share count, I started with the number that Lyft offers in their prospectus. They claim they will have 240.6 million shares, but I didn't stop there. I added two other items. One is about 6.8 million shares in deep, deep, deep in the money op options, which the strike price is like four and a half dollars or five dollars. They might as well count them as shares because they're so far in the money. And they also have, you know, about 25 million restricted stock units or 20, more than that, you know, almost 30 million restricted stock units, which they haven't counted because they're not vested. And my rationale is these 30 million units are being held not by all of the employees in small amounts. Some of them probably hold big chunks and they'll stay around and get them vested. So I'm going to take the what I think is the sensible assumption and count them all towards my total share count. So my total share count is going to be almost 30 million shares higher than, or 39 million shares higher than what uh, you will see in the Lyft prospectus or perhaps even in the per share numbers that analysts use. So bring them all together, here's what my valuation looks like. So you have $120 billion total market doubling over the next 10 years to become you know, a, a $300 billion market by the time you get to year 10. So it is actually going to be a huge growth in the total market. I had the, my, <clears throat> my market share will increase as, you know, as the ride-sharing companies continue their dominance from 10 to 40%. This is an optimistic story, in case you're wondering. Uh, my revenues go from 3.4 billion to almost 26 billion. My losses become profits. I continue to reinvest. So early on, I get negative cash flows, and that might be one reason you're seeing the rush to go in, to go to markets. Is you will need more capital. There'll be cash burning in these companies for the next few years, but eventually the cash flows turn positive, and they turn very positive. Ultimately, if you bring all these things together, the value that I get for the operating assets with my story is about 14 billion, and that incorporates the 10% failure rate. Now, one of the things in IPOs that you have to factor in that you don't with traditional companies, on the offering date, you have cash coming into the company, the proceeds. If those proceeds leave the company as they did in Spotify, you can ignore them, but if they're going to stay in the company, and uh, in this case, you know, Lyft has specified that they're going to keep the proceeds in the company for operating needs, you've got to add the two billion on. My total value for Lyft at, for the for the IPO valuation is about $16 billion. Now, that might strike you as optimistic or pessimistic depending on how you perceive my story, but as I said, this is my story and my value. If you don't like it, I you know the spreadsheet I have, the valuation is an open source spreadsheet. We can change the numbers, change the assumptions, and you can see what the value would come up with your story. Now, when the stock opens for trading on the offering day, I'm a realist. I know that it's not the value that's going to drive the number that you're going to see on the stock. It's going to be pricing. It's going to be the pricing game that drives how Lyft is priced. You think, what's the pricing game? In the pricing game, investors decide how much to pay for a stock by looking at similar stocks and scaling their prices to something they have in common. That's, uh, that sounds abstract. You see this all the time when investors use P-E ratios uh, to compare across companies or EV to EBITDA multiples. The pricing game is going to be difficult with Lyft for two reasons. It's the first ride-sharing company to list, so there aren't other ride-sharing companies out there that are that are traded in the market. They're, they're pricing, but it's a venture capital pricing, and that might come from June of last year or January of last year. It's date. The second is <clears throat> to compare prices, you've got to scale them to something. As I said, with conventional companies, you scale prices to earnings or revenues or book value. You, something of substance. The problem with ride-sharing companies is you can't use any earnings number. They're all negative. The book value has no meaning. Maybe, maybe the revenues. But even though it's going to be difficult, people are going to try. So here's what I did. I took the five big ride-sharing companies. I looked at the gross billings. This is the total amount that people pay for the ride-sharing. The revenues at each of these companies, the operating profit really losses, and the number of riders. Okay. Then I computed, and then I looked at the VC pricing for each of the each of the five companies. Up, to, up at this point, that's all you have is the VC pricing. And remember that VC pricing is stale; it's six months, nine months old. 
And here's what I did. I took the most recent VC pricing and I divided by billing, divided by revenues, divided by riders, and I stopped that. Why? Those are the only three positive numbers I could get. Maybe I could do, divide by ri by, dri by number of drivers, but I didn't think that made much sense. So what I have is a price to billing ratio, price to revenue, and a price to rider for the five companies. I also computed an average for, for the a global average and a global weighted average. And then I did one additional line. This might sound outlandish, but there's already a rumor that Uber is going to go public, and the rumored pricing is about 120 billion. I know I'm really reaching here in my pricing here, but if in the last line, I've actually computed what the, what the pricing multiples would look like with $120 billion pricing for Uber. He's saying, how are you going to use this to price lift? It's very simple. You tell me what metric you want to price against and who you want to compare it to. I'll come up with the pricing for Lyft by taking the current billing, the current revenues, and the current rider and applying the right multiple. So take a look at this table. It shows you the range you can get depending on whether you use price per rider, rider on a global weighted average, in which case the, the pricing should be about $5 billion. Or if you use Uber's rumored price and price per rider, in which you can, you can get $37 billion. I mean, you can get 5 to $37 billion. You're saying, which one will I see? Well, it depends on what the agenda of the person making the case is. If the person is trying to convince you to buy Lyft, be, 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 almost, it's almost guaranteed you're going to see price per rider against Uber or price per... In fact, you're going to see very little talk about the Asian companies and riders because it's going to give them too low value. My point is pricing is as much about what you're trying, the agenda you have, and what you're trying to tell me as it is about finding the truth. The bottom line here is whatever the final pricing is on left. And my guess is it could be, you know, the, the stock of 20 billion, 25 billion. You know, but we don't know. It's going to have a feedback effect. Because here's how I think about pricing. Pricing is like a ladder where if I move one rung, I've got to move all my other rung. Let me explain. Uh, let's suppose a, you know, the lift pricing goes well, that they get a $25 billion pricing, which is the high end of the spectrum. I can almost guarantee that Uber is going to be much quicker to the market if that happens, and the Uber pricing might end up being $140 billion if Lyft is priced at $25 billion. If Lyft is priced at $11 billion or $12 billion, the pricing doesn't go well, you're going to see Uber perhaps hold back, but here's the problem. Even if they hold back and decide to get money from venture capitalists, guess how venture capitalists decide how much to price companies are? They look at the ladder as well. So what happens to, to Lyft is going to have consequences not only for the other ride-sharing companies in the public markets, but within the private markets. So this is an IPO that's going to be watched intensely from all of those ride-sharing companies because it's going to have huge consequences for them. So here's where we are. We are, we still, there's a lot we don't know about Lyft yet. Some of the uncertainties will get resolved. We'll find out soon enough how much they plan to raise in the offering. But there are lots of uncertainties that, that are not going to be resolved because they have nothing to do with the IPO. They have to do with the future of the company. And as this game plays out, at some point, perhaps in the next few weeks, you're going to see a pricing for Lyft that the bankers are going to come up with, an offering price. And I use the word pricing deliberately because bankers don't value companies. They price them, they, and it's not their fault. You, I mean, they're like realtors. You've got to price a house to sell it. They have to price it. And I have no problem with them pricing it and using any of the metrics I talked about. Unfortunately, though, for whatever reason, bankers don't seem to like to admit that they price companies. They want to create this facade that they value companies. So you're going to see a lot of talk about value, which I would discount. You might even see a discounted cash flow valuation of Lyft. But I, you know, my guess is that discounted cash flow valuation is going to be what I call a Kabuki DCF. You know what a Kabuki DCF is? This is where you know what you want to get at the end of the, of the valuation. So what you do is you play with the inputs. You create this facade of actually going through the process of valuation when you fully well know that you want to end up at 10 times revenues or uh, one and a half times gross billings. Now, I think that it's a game that is going to get played, and I want you to step back and think about that game when you hear talk about valuations of, of Lyft and what people have come up with. So thank you very much for listening.